Hello, people. Welcome to Wrestling with the Devil. I am here with my good friend and partner, Renee. And I am also here with a very special person in my life, my sister, Margaret. And Maggie, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Nice fall day in New York. Can't ask for anything more. Good. And, and Maggie, uh, uh, a lot of people in this genre knows that I, you and I got together uh, a couple weeks ago in Houston. We hadn't seen each other in, in a couple decades, probably. Wow. And uh, I would tell anybody that if you got somebody in your family that you have not talked to in a long time, reach out and try to correct it. Because those three days that I was around Maggie are three days that I will never forget because it really corrected a lot of things between us. Would that be correct, Maggie, to say? Absolutely. Absolutely. And. But, uh, you know, we're going to we're here to talk because there's this lawsuit that's out now uh, and it's all these ring boys that are coming forward and they're suing. And um, how do you feel, Maggie, to see uh, retribution happening at this time and uh, this all coming back on Vince McMahon after all what Tom's been going for three years now? Uh, how do you feel about that? I have a lot of I have to say I have a lot of mixed emotions. Um I initially watched the Netflix release of his documentary and, and watching that documentary, it was very emotional. And um, I was very angry because it was so evident what was going on and that it was true for all these years and all these victims. And then to have this lawsuit surface, it just really puts it all into perspective and also just how, how, how true everything was. There were times when, um, you know, my, Tommy was called the liar. This, it, it, you know, they're not sure if this really happened. And then uh, amongst other things and with his name being tainted and to have the truth just right in your face, it just, it brought, it, it just hit me right to the core. A lot of emotion, angry, sad, um, um. And Maggie, would you say that you were the closest to Tom out of the brothers and sisters? I, I mean, I don't know if that's true, but I felt that we were very close. We lived not too far. Well, this is a this family. is a picture. This is a picture of you. How old are you in this picture, Maggie? I'm probably around ten. And that's little Tommy next to you. Yeah, that's Tommy right there. Yeah. And that's our brother Eddie in the back. Yes. And so that's that was taken in Mount Kisco, New York, too. Am I Mount right? Kisco, yeah, eighty-two North Mosier. Okay. And uh, so and I'm going to put up some pictures that people have never seen before because we want to give Tom, you know, Tom's not a ring boy. Tom was, how successful was Tom in his life? And, and when, when I say that, Maggie, people have to understand Tom grew up in the streets. He was a street guy. You know, I tell the story about once I came home to when dad and mom was alive and I was reach, going in the kitchen and I reached the top of a cabinet and there was a gun up there. And I pulled it down and I said to Tom, whose gun is this? And Tom said it was he was holding it for a friend. Mm. So the famous he was holding it for a friend thing. And uh, I remember taking the bullets out of the gun and putting the gun back because wow. I knew Tom probably didn't even know where to buy bullets. He knows yeah. nothing about guns. At that time, he didn't. That was the perfect street kid answer, too, you know. Yeah. But, but see, he was at that point in his life where his life could have taken any direction. Is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, when Tom was uh, in his late teens, I mean, he could have gone either way. Um, you know, and what people don't understand is that when you grow up in poverty and mental illness and on the streets, when you go home and there's no one in the home and and you're pretty much just left homeless. Uh, that's a life that uh, is it should not be judged, which it's unfortunate. But I felt that even this lawsuit and, and everything that went on with the WWEF and the McMahons, uh, there was a lot of judgment there. Well, they were poor kids. They were this, they were from the streets. Well, you know what? Mel Phillips knew exactly what he was doing. He went there and he he put himself in a, in a situation where he knew that he was going to lure, you know, hungry, homeless children. And Tom loved wrestling. He loved it. I don't know if I've ever, uh, you know, knew anything of anyone besides Lee that loved wrestling as much. And they, you, you know, he used that as a pawn to lure him in. And um, it's, 
it, it's just, uh, it, it is the most disgusting, profound thing that anyone can do to another human being. Now, what, what would you say, what would you say, uh, what made Tom, okay, Tom gets away from wrestling, I was saying, we're going to get back to that. Tom came, got away from wrestling. What do you think made him straighten out his life where he went from being this wild street kid, street fights, you name it, all the way to being a totally different, you know, at that time he walked away from wrestling, he had nothing to do with it anymore. What do you think saved him? And describe how Tom's life went as a human being. Describe who Tom Cole really was. Well, you know, Tom was, you know, he grew up in the street, so he was, he, you know, he didn't have any guidance. Uh, he didn't have a safe place to go at night and know that he's going to be fed and uh, a warm place to sleep. So, you know, he was constantly in survival mode. And then, you know, like most of us, we meet that, we meet that man or woman in our life that changes everything. And, you know, a relationship, I know for Tom, when he met his wife, um, that really turned him around. And, and you know, Matt, and Maggie, I can tell you something about the, when he met his wife. Tom had that little apartment above uh, in Carmel. And uh, at that time, your brother, me, in trouble with the law and hiding out and everything, I decided to go move in with Tom. And that never happened before because Tom always moved in with us. Right. You know, all of us. <laughs> so, but Tom had this little apartment. I lived with him and he, and he goes out to the club. He meets, he meets Jen. And then I remember he came back to me that night and he says, you know, I'm dating this girl. And then next thing I know, within a couple of days, now Tom's been with hundreds of girls. He's in love. And, and it's an amazing thing because then he came to me nicely and he said, well, you know, I think it's time that you go find your own place. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you don't get to pick who you love, man. And he found someone he loved. And, uh... and I said, but I'm your brother. And he goes, well, you know. Uh, so actually that worked out good for me. I went to Somers and I found a nice apartment, but you know, that, that was when he first met Jen and, you know, no matter what kind of trouble they had in their relationship, that beginning and that bond between the two of them, that woman saved his life. I would Absolutely. Say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so describe what, you know, now you were around Tom when he started building his family up and stuff. So describe what kind of life he had, what he did for a living and uh, uh, exactly uh, who his children were and what they were like. I, he was he, he loved his wife. He loved his children. He adored them. Um, very involved in their lives. Very involved. And he worked in Manhattan and he did uh, security for high end families. He was uh, very happy. Uh, everything he did, he did for his children and his life that he, he had now built. Um, he became responsible. And uh, bought a did, you ever think you, did you ever think he would say that? I, you know, I, I prayed that he would. You know, I knew if he met that right person that can, you know, make him feel important because I think that's what it is. It's, a, you know, a marriage or a relationship is not just about two people meeting and, you know, having that, you know, the um, intimacy. It's about, you know, are you the right people to help build each other up and you become successful together? And uh, he definitely found that in his his wife. Um, and for years, he was a great dad. We spent a lot of holidays together. And describe what's this, who's in this picture and where was this taken? This was at my wedding. And that's Tom with uh, Brocky and Jason and Ed. And Tom was always the life of the party. Okay, so t Eddie, Eddie's sitting down. That's yeah. uh, And you can see everyone's happy because that's what Tom did for everyone. He, he, yeah. he was always joking, always very funny. And his, um, and his two nephews loved it. Loved it. Oh, they loved were it. like his. Uh, he and Brocky were more like brothers than anything else. They were uh, as tight as two can be. Two and Brocky pieces. never. And Brocky never got over his death. I think. No, definitely not. De definitely not. They were. They were brothers. Uh, and then all the way in the background right. there is our brother. That is Danny. Danny. Yeah, Danny. And um, yeah, Tom was always very fun-loving. Loved to joke and. He can turn any room into a, a you know, into a c comedy show. I, you know, I used to say, you know, Tom, you really should do stand up. Um, you know, obviously all he ever did was uh, reenact our childhood, but it was some funny stuff. 
Uh, I, I mean, not that it, it deserved to be laughed at, but you know, that's how we survived. We found laughter in it because uh, if you don't, if you don't laugh, you're going to cry or you're just never going to make it. You're not going to make it through. So what's you describe so my you? wedding? That's yeah. Danny, Tom and Eddie. And where's Lee? Lee was, uh, yeah, he wasn't there that day. Yeah, Lee was, was I running from people? Probably. <laughs> you were probably running, yeah, I think you were running. Lee was wanted by the law. He couldn't yeah, and my wedding was in New York, so, uh, yeah, yeah. I had this thing about coming into New York. I didn't like that warrant. <laughs> yeah, this was in uh, Douglaston Manor in Queens, so you were definitely not coming nearby. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's Tom in the middle. And yeah. as you can see, Tom's a big, strapping, handsome man. What would you say, Renee? Was he a good-looking Yeah, man? he's a big healthy good looking guy man you know when when i hear you talk about all this and i see his beautiful family and now meeting your sister even though i never knew tom i get somewhat emotional thinking about what he went through and all the things that happened to him to make him go through what he did so yeah it, i you guys are blessed to have a good family i'll tell you that and uh who's in this picture maggie that's Brocky, myself, and Tom, and that's and at his home, his home in uh, where and he Brocky, lived. And Brocky, Brocky, who was his nephew, became like his brother, would you they, say? They that? were brothers. There's no doubt. I mean, they were tight as thieves. And even though he called Tom Uncle Tom, they they, they you know, they were that, that far apart in age, just a few years. They lived next door, next, next, next pretty much, uh, you know, miles from one another. Um, they both had children around the same age. Um, they did with brothers and sisters. They built the family, you know, at, together, obviously, and um, they adored each other. I mean, this was actually the last time I was with both of them together. Uh, usually, when I was over, Brock and Brock was there, so it was always the three of us. Um, yeah. And you know what I noticed about this picture? Tom was struggling, struggling mentally at this time, and but and you could tell in this smile, it's kind of a force. yeah. Forced smile. He, yeah, he, no, he he was he he was going through stuff. Definitely, yeah, he was definitely going through stuff. And uh, why don't you describe this picture to us? This is Joan and and Tom and Tom loved and adored Joni. I mean, they talked for hours when he would come home from work. They talk on the phone. He absolutely adored Joan. That's you know his big sister, and um, you know being the baby in the family, the baby brother. We all kind of just. You know, you couldn't do anything but want to help Tom and see him happy. And, um, you know, if he needed something, he usually got what he wanted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, how was Tom in relationships with women before he met Jen? Oh, he's, he's terrible. He just, you know, they were just, you know. Yeah. Something to do. I mean. I, I remember Tom having three, four girlfriends at the same time and, and one on the phone and, and tell him when he loves them and you're the only one for me. Who's here? Oh, wow. Look who it is. Hey, hey. what's going on? Back from the dead. Uh, hey, literally. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just what's so going you know, on? just so do you know so you know, Stephen is uh is our nep is our nephew and he is and and he wanted to come on and talk about Tom. And uh, Stephen was in. You were. You almost died a couple months ago. Am I correct? Not almost. <laughs> uh, 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 almost. I pretty much was dead. Yeah. That's why I used to spend back from the dead. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt so, about it. So you got sick, and we uh, we none of us thought you were going to make it. And by yeah. some a miracle of God, you're sitting here right now. And so all I need is a chance. You got to give me a chance to fight, and I'll fight. That's all. Man, uh, nice that's to meet it. you, Stephen, and that's great to hear from you. That's the, the right attitude. That's why you're probably here. Yeah, that's right. Nice to meet you, too, man. Nice to hey, meet Maggie. you. Hey, Maggie. Hi. Uh, what's going on, y'all? <laughs> yeah, I called Steve this morning. I said, you know, it'd be nice to have you come. And I thought you were going to call in, but you you came on like this. is awesome, dude. Uh, right. oh, yeah, I just had to figure out the little app there. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Describe to us your relationship with Tom and what he was like to you. Uh, Tom was a great dude. Um, I, I like I always tell people like my sense of humor. I I honestly get it from Tom because like as a little boy, like he he was just always funny. Every time I like hung out with him, he would make me laugh more than anybody. Like any comedian you see on TV anywhere, like Tom was just naturally super funny, laid back, and you know that's why it was such a shocker what happened to him because he had the the best poker face I've ever seen because I never. 
like I, I would have never thought what happened would have happened. I mean, it, it is a true shocker. But you know, as a young kid, you know, hanging out with Tom was just a, it was always a blast. It was always a laugh. It was always a good time. Yeah. And uh, yeah. he was a really good dude. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I'm still and, at a loss for words. And do, how much do you think that Tom's death, and then almost your death, has affected this family? Has it been a I, I kind of feel like it's been a positive, even though there was a lot of negative in it, because it made people closer in the family. Yeah, no, I would say so, definitely. Um, you know, with, with the, everything that happened with Tom, I mean, it definitely a lot of things like came out that I, I didn't I didn't really know about that he was going through, and like you know he was suffering a lot, and um, you know, definitely when I was sick. Like I was able to kind of like, you know, pull off of that because like, you know, I was suffering as well. And I kind of looked at it like, you know, what was me? You know, even though I'm sitting in the ICU and everything was going on, I look at other people, they're suffering too. And there's no reason for me to, you know, get down on myself or blame anyone else. You know, I just kind of, you know, pulled together, you know, and definitely yep. like Tom's, Tom's step, I was able to kind of like look at that and say, you know, Tom would probably sit in that ICU with me and get me to laugh as soon as I woke up. You know, like out of a coma that they had me. You know, Tom would have been there every day. Oh yeah, yeah. Because he, Tom would have been there. He was down in the city. You know that he would have been there every day. No doubt about it. And he, he actually, you know, like uh, you know, it might be too much information, but I have a Colossi bag now, and he had a Colossi bag. He would have been the perfect person to call up and ask, like, you know, you know, what exactly are you going through? And I guarantee you, he would have made some kind of a joke out of it. He would have made light out of it. He would have said, you know, whatever, you know. He would have Yo, said it ain't wanna... shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, I think. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 who Tom was. I mean, like you know, like sometimes people say I have a dark sense of humor. Like you know, maybe I kind of do or whatever. But I feel like, you know, you know, it is what it is. You got to find a way to pull through shit. And then that's why Tom was like one of those types of people who was able to pull himself through stuff. You know, granted what happened. You know, what happens happens. But you know. Now yeah. we're gonna get, we're gonna get to the tough part, guys. And Maggie, you tell me first because you were very much involved with it. And then I'll go to Steve. Maggie, okay. I don't want to. I've discussed on here too much where I was the day that Tom died. Um, tell us how it happened because you helped. You were with the family all through that time. Um, so t tell us about the day Tom died. Uh, the day he died. Um... I had received a call from his wife and obviously something incredibly wrong. Um, and she says, you know, he did it, he did it. And I just, uh, you know, it, it's almost as if you disassociate from the moment because I knew what that meant. And uh, she had said that he had taken his life and my world will never be the same. It will never be the same. I could not get there fast enough and found when I got to the house, I just sat in my car and was, you know, just, uh, it was hard to get out because that reality. And um, they had taken his, taken his remains away. And uh, Rocky, Rocky was there and leaving. I, I don't remember. It just, you know, in, in when you are in a situation like that, um, you completely disassociate. It, like, you know, you almost go into a, um, a survival mode where to protect you mentally because it's that catastrophic. And um, I, saw, I met with his daughters and his wife and um, we went over to her 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 mom's house and we spent time there and there was a lot of a lot of different emotion and um you know i was very angry and in disbelief uh you know as you know uh there was a lot of blame tossed around and um i guess that's what people do at those moments um but for me i just wanted to do whatever i could for his girls um and try to make this thing as best as it could be and um, help with the arrangements as much. I was there for about a week, 10 days, I stayed in a hotel room. And, um, you know, we went through the process of, of uh, 
planning his burial. It was during COVID. So not many people were allowed to come. So they couldn't fly down and come in because we could only have a certain amount. Um, but it was like floating on a cloud. And uh, my, you, you just like, like, um Stevie said this is a this is a guy that did nothing but make us laugh you know and uh it could make a light out of any situation i mean you know it doesn't matter what it could be and and now he's gone and and, and he hung himself and just uh, you know how does this happen how does this happen and of course we all have that guilt you know, because, you know, at, towards the end of his life, he was very sad. And uh, people avoided him because he was sad. And, you know, he talked a lot about, you know, almost as the desperation of, yeah, if I can make it through today. And, you know, you hear people talk like that. But I think Tom's Tom's personality and his laughter kind of masked that a little bit. It was probably his survival with the uh, comedy. We you know, through humor. If we did not have yeah. humor, neither one of yeah. us would be alive right me, now. Me too, and a lot. Yes, I agree. Our, you know, yeah. you can't. You know, we learned very early. You can't take life serious too serious. No, because if no. you do, you know, we have we all have reason to do what he did. You know, we yes. all grew up that rough, and we've all everybody. Been, yeah, everybody gets on the. A, a lot of people not go through. You know, you, you you get to the edge. I've been there. Others yeah. have been there, where you think about doing something to yourself. But most of us have that thing to stop us. Yeah, I agree, hundred yeah. percent. That you you worded it perfectly. Yep. And and as I tell people, that day Tom talked to me. He had made up his mind by the time he talked to me. He I was, think he made up his mind prior to that day. Yeah. And I don't know if he had an exact day picked, but I think it could have possibly been the first opportunity he had to be alone. Um, it was during COVID, so everybody was locked up. Everybody was in the house constantly. People just started to kind of like venture out. And I think- Where was his daughters? They went skiing that day. And it was actually from um, what I'm told, it was the first day he was in the house in, in months by himself, the first time. And, uh, you know, yeah, I just, it's, it's still to this day. It's just. It's an outside of body experience when you lose a loved one. I know. You know I can't it, even describe. It's like you're watching yourself almost. Yeah. I know. And I'll tell you too. I'll tell you too. I almost didn't make it out of that hotel room because this is my third sibling. We grew up together. Yeah. Well, we were tight. You know, and and now my 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 crew is gone, and why am I here? You know. And when we think, and when you say that, Danny, a year before this, well, who passed first? Alice. Danny. Passed. Danny yeah. passed, and then Alice passed a, a year later, and then seven months, Tom. And so we, we had wow. the, the younger brothers and sisters all passed away within a three-year period. Steve, I want to ask you, where were you when you heard yeah. about? What, where were you when you heard what happened to Tom, and who told you? To be completely honest, I, mean, I don't remember 110%, but I, I know I was at home or I was like making it towards home. Uh, I was coming out of work and I heard about it. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you hear some things and you, you don't really believe it whatsoever because I've heard a lot of crazy shit that ended up not being true. So I kind of was like, no, there's no yeah, way. Like, crazy, yeah. the fuck out of here. But then, you know, the reality sets in, you know, there was a funeral plan. And I'm like, what? Because like every time I over like talk to him, I never maybe I I just wasn't like in tune enough. But like I just there were never you could tell me before that that he would have took his own life. I would have never ever believed it. Like well, I would have baby nephew, he would have never put that on you. We always took oh, Tom yes. we always took Tom as this ego manical uh, egomaniac that was in love with himself. Tom had the, the whitest teeth in the world for any man. I'd put his teeth up against anybody. But he wasn't that. He was the most insecure human yes. being you can, yes. you, can, you can possibly. And people didn't understand that. And if you don't understand that about Tom and you think that he's conceited, you can very much, you know, t talk him off a bridge. You know, he needed to feel loved. He needed to feel, he needed to hear that he was important and that he was good looking and, and loved, he needed that. And he wasn't getting that. And um, 
yeah, it's, I still can't, I, you know, it's still hard. I remember, I remember when Tom used to call me, he, okay, just so you people know, Tom, Tom had, Tom was making very good money. He, financially, his family was doing well compared to a lot of families. Uh, it wasn't the finances. Um, he had three beautiful daughters that he loved. How much would you say he loved his daughters? Oh, more than life. And this is a picture of, and, and where is this picture taken right here of Tom with his three daughters? If I had to guess, I would say Costa Rica. Yep, yeah, it's Costa Rica. And uh, uh, and you cut the daughters out of this picture, but he's with his girls here, right? Yeah, I just don't want them to feel, you know. Yeah. You, you know, you try to protect them. So we're going to ask a question. I'm going to ask you guys if you know who this woman is right here. Okay. Ashley Massaro. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now, Ashley Massaro had children. Uh, actually, had a daughter. Uh, she, uh, her son, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I think, uh, but she had a child. And um, she, was was a, she was in a house two year, exactly two years before Tom died, almost two years to the day. She was in a house by herself, and she hung herself. And Ashley Massaro hung herself because... Uh, they covered up a. Uh, uh, they covered up a, a, a the R word. We got to be careful what we say on YouTube. Uh, yeah. That happened to her in Saudi Arabia. Um, the McMahons covered it up. They wouldn't even let her talk about it, and she was suing them at that time for it. And um, she lost everything. Uh, now this is a company that made her get in the ring and wrestle, and she did not know how to wrestle, and she wanted to go to wrestling school. And Stephanie McMahon told her absolutely no. So she was severely injured and got addicted to pain medications. Yep. And I remember Tom calling me when she hung herself. And I didn't even know who she was. But now that I'm back in this business, I know who everybody is now because of research and stuff. And I was telling somebody yesterday, I was on a radio show and I told them the reason that everything's coming to light right now is because of Ashley Massaro, Tom Cole, and Janelle Grant. Yeah. And you, do you guys know who Janelle Grant is? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Janelle Grant nope. is, <laughs> and she and and she's the one that's claiming that uh, Vince McMahon uh, did a lot of really bad things, and we see in that lawsuit horrible stuff, just like this Ring Boy lawsuit. Yeah. Steve, I'm going to ask you as an outsider: when you hear all this stuff coming in about the WWE, all this sexual abuse allegations over a 40 year period, do you find it amazing that they just have not? ever really been uh, gotten in trouble for any of it, even though it's been out there and people have been coming out and, and suing them for years for this kind of stuff? Is that towards me or did you say Renee? Oh, or you, Stephen? Um, I, I do find it amazing, but I mean, just if you look at the, the product and, you know, what they actually put out there is a bunch of filth and, you know, foolishness. I mean, I'm not surprised. I'm surprised that, you know, nobody caught on to this a little bit sooner. Do you think because this was wrestling, it was kind of taken as a joke? All this sexual stuff happening, and people were saying. It I, th was I think it was money, and I think it was money and power that covered it up. I think that the wrestling is like a one big circus. It's like the circus act of what they made out of Elvis Presley. Yeah, and um, you know they 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 don't value life. They don't well, that, value well, that life. Money, of guy. That they consider throwaway people, and these are poor children in the streets. And they, I'm sorry, but the, between the documentary and everything that's out there, shame on you. Yep. Uh, I, would like, I would like 30 seconds alone with that man. 30 seconds. I mean, and to, you know, we can say that, oh, it happened so long ago to Tom. You know, it didn't affect him. It didn't make him kill himself. Okay, yeah. It may have not been the smoking gun, but... It sure the hell didn't help. Well, and Maggie, constantly in the media, they just would not leave it alone. And it was a constant reminder. I was there. I spoke with Tom about it regularly. It's he didn't want his daughters to be exposed to this. He didn't want this 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 filth. And they just would not leave him alone. And when Maggie, did, Maggie, did, did you ever meet Linda McMahon? Yes, I did. You tell us about that meeting and why you were there. Was it, I believe it was 92, don't, you know. Right around the time Tom settled. Yeah, well, I was there when he signed right. that thing. And, right. um, you know, I was young. You know, I was working at Sloan Kettering, and um, 
just, you know, trying to keep my own head above water. And uh, Tom had come, he had initially called and said, well, would you come to, with me to WWF? Um, they want to talk about, you know, what's been going on and about possibly, you know, getting my job back. And he already know, had uh, no, he already had his job back. Oh, okay. So yeah. And you know, so just so people know. It was something about back pay and about moving yeah. forward and, and all he, that he, stuff. So what, what what when Tom met with you in ninety two, um, the lawsuit uh the agreement was already signed, but what happened is Linda McMahon started messing around and wanted to change things on the lawsuit. And I think that he wanted you to come with him because she wanted to change some more yeah. stuff on the lawsuit. And I guess that uh, when you went to the meeting, do you remember what she was saying? Uh, basically, I remember I got there, I got uh, shown all around, you know, I don't know what that was about, but, and I met his daughter, his wife, his daughter, I think his son was in the office. Oh, that's his son. Um, then we were brought into the conference room with their lawyer and uh, Linda. And you know, she she said she's just stated how they were trying to help him, help Tom, put him in school, and yada yada, and how great this is. Now, thinking back to that day, I it it really infuriates me because they didn't tell me the whole story. I was young. I you know nobody you know, knew. No, nobody knew the whole story. No one. But yeah. you know, they yeah. they use that to their advantage. Number yeah. one, I don't think they should have had any of that going on without Tom's lawyer in the room. Well, that's one of the things that was said. And and uh, when I was in my last meeting, the last day I was meeting with Vince McMahon, we had started to have an argument because he broke into my answering machine. But they got the code from Tom to the answering machine. And when they got into the answering machine, and uh, they seen everybody I was talking to, all the names. They, they had them all written down. And I always tell... And on the third day of the meetings, I went into Vince and we started arguing because he broke into my, but at that time, like I tell everybody, I was a wanted felon. Right. So I was like, I was saying to myself, Maggie and, and Steve, I was saying to myself, how stupid are these people to not realize that I'm a felon? Why haven't they checked me yet? And yeah. I'm here in Connecticut, there's New York, New York City and is looking for me. You cannot, but they never looked until my friend ratted me out and then I got arrested. But, you know, being in those rooms, Maggie, and you described how they showed you the building and stuff, they were grooming you, just like they grew oh, absolutely, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, I think, is why I'm so angry today, you know, and why I'm so disgusted, because it's all so clear now. How much, how involved would you say, Maggie, Linda McMahon was involved with the Ring Boy cover-up? I can't see that she didn't know. I mean, that's ridiculous to say she didn't yeah. know. You There's can't. no way. Come on. There's no <laughs> way. Come on. And when you this went there, was you... so out there. I mean, there are photos, videos. I mean, talk and and you're not talking about. Oh well, this just happened one year. This went on for decades. And when you went there, and when you went there, it wasn't Vince McMahon that was talking to you about what happened with Tom. It was Linda, because Vince McMahon. Passed it to Linda and walked away. He said, you know, no. I, you know, I, I can't say for sure. I can only speculate, but you know, usually the woman has a lot to do with being in charge. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, was, and it, well, it was, you know, what it was like with, with Linda. I always picture her this way: her husband was always getting in trouble, and she always had to clear it up. Yeah, that she, was she, <laughs> and because she, this was her empire too. She was probably worse than him. If you think well, about it, they, just because she's innocent, she gets on TV and she's uh, she's probably worse than he was. Yeah, she's probably like a mother really figure. <laughs> she is the and her Isn't daughter it? and her daughter <laughs> Stephanie became the same way when she tried when she covered up uh, what happened to Ashley Massaro when she got attacked in Saudi Arabia. The daughter, yeah. the father, told Stephanie. You stay near her and don't let this story get out. So once again, Vince McMahon is no longer passing it on to his wife to cover up. He's passing it on to his daughter. And her daughter and, and Stephanie had that same, uh, just like her mother, she she acted motherly toward her workers to cover up the empire that was now yeah. in Stephanie's empire. And it, so it's, when you think about this stuff, 
Uh, it, it's quite incredible. And also, guys, I want to tell you something Tom once said to me. Tom said to me, Lee, if I'm ever going to take my life, I'm going to do it just like Robin Williams. And I remember when he said that to me, I really didn't think much of, of it. And and then uh, Robin Williams, and I remember when he said that to me, I really didn't think much of, of it. And and then uh, Robin Williams hangs himself. And then shortly after that, Ashley Massaro does. And you have Tom thinking this in his mind. Tom's coming down. He's starting to get very sick. COVID hits. It affects his life dramatically. Uh, and he wind up hanging himself. Do you find uh, Tom, Tom, Tom was a bodyguard. He owned lots of guns. Why do you think that he chose to take his life that way and not the other way? Maggie? That's, um, it was cleaner. Or Steven. Lady first. I mean, perhaps it was cleaner. And, um, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, when, she, when I was told that he was gone, I, I assumed that he shot himself. I just assumed that. And then, then I, then, you know, because I was like in sh utter shock. And then um, Jen had said, no, he hung himself. And I'm like, oh, shoot. I would say, that's like the hardest way to do it. I mean, like, if you want to do it, I, I would think you'd want to do it the fastest way. I mean, you know, if you hang yourself, I think your body, like your brain is going to go into yeah. like a, like a, yeah. like a fight and not like you, you, you're not, you could probably see your way out of it. Like as soon as you put that thing around your neck or whatever, I don't mean any graphic. But like, wouldn't your body sort of have like a like an immediate reaction to just like, oh, I don't want to do this? Yes, I, you know, it, 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 it just seems weird. It happens all the time to people that try yeah. to do this for themselves. Yeah, people it, yeah. stop in the middle of it, but some of them can't stop. It's too late. They made it's that. It's too move. late. But the Golden Gate Bridge is a famous place for people to end their own whatever. And the people that have survived it, I think there's three people. They said their last thought was they wish they didn't jump. So yeah, I, I'm, it's it's scary. It's a scary thought, really. Now I'm going to get back into uh, to Stephen and Maggie. We just discovered. We just wanted to put Tom out there, who he was, and uh, that we all love him very much, and we miss him very much. And this ring boy uh, suit coming out is a good thing for those yep. those boys that may they get absolutely yeah they get they deserve they deserve. They deserve whatever they get. Yes. Yeah. It's a and, blessing in disguise. 100%. And that will never, let's make it clear, money will never fix what they've been through. And it will never give them their lives back. Yeah. No. Their innocence was were was taken. And I spoke to and I spoke to a couple of them and they've had and everybody's story, same thing happened, other things happened, but every one of them for their whole entire life, because of that man, because of that company. They went through their life, letting that always affected their life. Yep. And, you know, it's just one of those things. Maggie, what is it? Why don't you tell people what it is you do now for a living? I own a martial arts school. When people think, oh, you own a martial arts school, that's what I teach. But it, it's basically just the tool I use to help save and, and help others become and be all they dream to be and to just... Uh, the tool that I use to reach kids. I work with kids from for from of privilege. With I work with kids from not no pr not privilege. Um, that's my favorite work. When I'm working with um, companies that are, I go to uh, homeless shelters and bring clothing to the children and and to the parents during the holidays and things. That you know I that's that's my, you know one thing that Tom was always so proud of. And I have I have. I've accomplished a lot since his death and there are some big major milestones that he was not there to share it with. And I felt so alone with it. Like, wow, you know, I didn't realize how much I shared with him because he was always so proud to have a sister that's a black belt, kicks butt, so to speak. Um, yeah. So there's a lot, a lot of accomplishments that I'm not able to share with him, but you know, I tell myself he's, he's looking from up above, he's looking down and, um, and Maggie, whatever possessed you to get involved with sports? 
Uh, well, yeah. My, well, this is where Lee's looking for something. So. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I, 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 okay. Gee, I don't know, Lee. So, <laughs> as Lee would say, I was the only brother willing to, you know, play ball and uh, play sports. I was always, uh, you know, I, I I love sports. I'm always always very athletic, just gifted. I can pretty much do anything that I tried. And um, and I and used then, to, and I remember our guys. I used to. Uh, I had my brothers there, and you throw them a football, and they'll throw it back to you like a girl. You know? <laughs> so, That's so, great. <laughs> they, they, they just, you know, Tom became more athletic when he got older. Yeah. But back then, they were not athletic at all. And I would think you were, and actually, Alice was a little bit. Yeah. And uh, and you liked sports. You know, I always tell people the story about, you know, I remember we went we went to Lake Street, and I, we played those guys basketball two on two, and they see you and they start laughing. And the next thing you know, you're doing your Caitlin Clark from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, but then you just became a fantastic. Who introduced you really into martial arts? Here we go. Here's another one. Okay, well, listen, so that one, that one will put my life through hell. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, a will duh. Uh, you know, you know, after you graduate high school, you know, I, I spent some time where I was lost and, you know, homeless for a few months and um, then reconnected with Lee and met a Wilda and she was she was a, a kick ass black belt. I mean, she was cool. I, I admired her. And one day he's like, oh, you know, just try, you know, she'll show you some stuff. And we were in the park and she was showing me some stuff. I just loved it. I was like, yeah, this is what I got to do. So I started taking private lessons. And before I knew it, I, you know, I wind up in the school in Brooklyn and on an Avenue U and it was hardcore training the Koreans. And um, I just loved it. It took my life over. And I said, when I was a Brown belt, I said, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And, right. you know, back then, you know, not many women did it. Um, but uh, I was committed, you know, I, Took a couple of wrong turns, had to turn myself back around a couple of times. But um, yeah, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And I remember the first time I was in a um, I was in Manhattan and it was at the Lenox Hill neighborhood home. And that's, you know, for interfaith neighbor neighborhood program for kids, you know, teens from broken homes and things. And I remember there's this group of kids they asked me to teach. And I said, well, if I'm going to do it, I have to do it. And they have to wear uniforms and stuff. I don't want to just do it like Wampa Room. And so we did, and I just fell in love with how I was able to help these kids see the positive in themselves. And that's where it was born. And I, I was like, definitely. And, um, you know, I waited till my dad passed because he always said, don't leave that hospital. Martial arts isn't for girls. You know, what are you doing? You're crazy enough. But it actually calmed me down. And um, yeah, and I took it and I ran with it. And I mean, I had a lot of obstacles, a lot of obstacles, being a woman in the business and then, you know, just not having the support that I had wished I had, you know, it was tough. And, um, but I never, ever saw failure as an option. And that is not an option in my life. And um, Maggie, let me ask you a question. Well, you were in a man's world, martial arts. How much more successful are you now compared to those men that tried to help hold you down? I'm just right up there. Yeah. And let me ask you another question. How many, uh, how many uh, black belts do you have in your school at the time, at this time? Gosh, um, I have at least a hundred and active. Uh, how many active? I can't active. really give you that answer because. Give me active and how many you've had your whole life. All right, I'll say I've had I've had over a thousand black belts. Okay, and and, and um, you're one of the few schools that actually pays your people. You uh, yeah, give my them insurance. You actually give them a job where most martial arts schools uh, kind of yeah take advantage of their black belts. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I mean my 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 number one person has the insurance the health insurance I have. They get wow. paid very well. They get paid a school teacher salary and that's and if somebody um, if somebody it's wants important. To you have to take care of your people and you know but at the same time you know you have to make sure it's the right person you know i've i've had issues where i've you know i've i've wanted this for you know sometimes we want more for the person that they actually want for themselves um 
And it's yep. important to see that, you know, I recently had an issue where, you know, I, I thought I had my successor, but it didn't work out. Um, and I came to realize that no one can be my successor. I am me. Yeah. You have a standard of dedication. Yeah. You replicate it. Yeah. Hey, yep. Now, Steve, Stephen, so you, you, you fought this battle you came back, you almost died. Uh, you were in the hospital for quite a while. What is yep. it now, Steve, just so you know about Steven, you want to hear perseverance. He's in the hospital while he's in the hospital, his apartment gets flooded. So he loses his apartment while he's fighting for his life in the hospital. Yeah, that was crazy. So you you basically I was like, bro, you my luck. luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And here you are, Stephen. You've always had your own place. You've always been known as a gamer. You, you know, you did your own thing. You were kind of uh you were kind of more of the quiet one in the family, I always thought. You you, you kept to yourself more than any more would you say that's correct? Yeah, I'd say that's that's pretty much true. I don't like to get involved in nonsense, you know. Right. Yeah. Like it's kind of do my own thing. Like if somebody in our family was fighting, you stayed the hell out of it. Most most times, yeah. <laughs> and so, like a, you know, they're crazy. I don't want to get involved, so you know, whatever. No, there's no crazy people in our family. Okay. Stop it. <laughs> oh no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so people, just so you know, we have this really large family now. You know, really large family. I <laughs> we're there. It is. There it is, the opposite. You, uh, yeah. that guy. <laughs> we have this really large family. A matter of fact, and and we're going to get into race right now a little bit, uh, because it's important. My sister, uh, Debbie, married your father back when it was unheard of, nineteen seventy-two, yep. and we were just kids at that time. And uh, I don't. The, the, the twins were just barely. They were babies. They were running around with the diapers hanging down. And uh, <laughs> when they, I wasn't even a thought, <laughs> but, but you know, but you know something, I witnessed all that with, with my sister Joan, uh, the battle between my father and your family, and it wasn't pretty, you know. And uh, uh, over time, though, things change in society, but I remember that, and I remember that, and yeah. and, and you know, people don't understand. See, that was part of our family culture for a while. Yep. The racism. Would you say that's correct? correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess so. I mean, I, I kind of came around in, what, 1985. And, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't back. I wasn't there. So, I, you know, I didn't experience that. I experienced my own set of racism throughout my life. But, uh, you know. But it happened more with your, your brother. Your brother, Robert, had a lot of anger. And he had every right to have anger. And yeah. He seen more, and um, it really. I always felt that it had always affected him, mine and his relationship, because he was angry at my dad, and uh, me. To me, to, I'm one of the few people that my dad is a hero. Until I get older and I understand the things that were happening, you know, you think about things more. And well, uh, dad, dad was a bigot. I mean, yeah, he but he admitted. It. He admitted yeah. it. because yeah. I remember when my father got to know your father. Yeah, they would sit out front. My father used to chase your father with a bat down the street. I remember. But the, that. those were the times, Lee. Like my father was born in 1939, so it's that same era of fathers. My father was white, blonde hair, blue eyes. My mother was Puerto Rican. Um, my grandmother, my father's mother, wouldn't talk to him because he married her, and didn't even talk to him until he had kids and then that's what brought us together so that racism didn't just happen in your family at that time and they got married in 1971 so Those it's the, the times, same time yeah. it's just the way the archie bunker you know everyone's dad was like my dad was like archie bunker so it's yeah, that's just the way it was at that time it, like, yep, there, like I, it's hard, how, do you, how do you get mad at one person who grew up they, they, that was their environment that's the way they were it taught just, it, you it know was, it was sick i, my, my, I couldn't yeah. possibly get yeah, you're right, though. You, you're you right. You're absolutely, you said it exactly right. They were taught to be that. 100%. And because my first wife was Puerto Rican, and a dark-skinned Puerto Rican. And uh, I remember when I bought my a picture home to my father and showed it to him. And what he said to me, I can't say it here. Yeah. But my you father know. became very close with her as he got older. But I remember as much as him and your father went at it, I I found it ironic when I seen him sitting down in the front lawn drinking beer together, having a good old time. <laughs> there you go. You know, it's like, uh, and you know your father. Your father, he, he was a very funny guy. Listen, he was no angel, but neither was my father. 
<laughs> you know, yeah. when your dad was a, he was a different type of guy. But you know what? Your dad persevered and straightened his stuff out. Yep. You know? Oh, and, yeah. And that, that's oh, yeah. I mean, I, heard, I, I heard plenty of stories about my father. Like, he, you know, he had, you know, major issues with the drinking and all this type yes. of stuff and all this type of stuff. But, like, he was my hero. Like, you know, like, he, he anything he could do for me, sure off his back, his last dollar, and he would go suffer while, you know, he was a father, a real man, like a yeah. true real man. Right. And, and he set a good example for me to be a real man. And, you know, I remember, okay. do you remember the saying your father used to do my my mom? My marquee, my marquee. Your father used to drive this marquee around, and he had no license. Okay. I'll never forget this. And he was yep. in Mount Kisco by Diplomat Towers, and there was this off Maple Avenue when you guys lived down on Maple Avenue. There was this turn that he took, and the car went over the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> and it went over the cliff. The Grand Marquis <laughs> took a dive, yeah, huh? <laughs> and your father got out of the car and ran and took off and went home. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually they found out that the marquee was born there. But your father used to love that marquee and he used to go, My marquee, my marquee, my marquee. <laughs> and he used, to, he used to make me laugh my ass off. And, uh, uh, you, you know, but that was, when, when we we're talking about this, that's the thing is you remember, you remember the good at that time, the bad times sucked. Yeah. You, you know, but, yeah. you know, I always liked your dad. Always. I thought, you know, uh, I never really sided with my father on that one. Thank God. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, I never, I never heard my father ever. The only thing my father, I think, he ever said bad about my mother's side of family is like uh, the Cole family. It's just crazy, but that's it. He never <laughs> ever said he never, he never like honed in on one person and said this or that or whatever. When Danny passed away, he was devastated. Like he, like, it, like he was totally devastated by that. Because Danny, and, like, you know, every, you know. <sighs> My, my father, I, he did Danny, not have a problem with my mother's side of the family, like Danny, at all. And Danny was always very close with your side of the family, probably more so than anybody in my family. Would you yep. say that with Danny? Danny, you crazy. He crazy. But, you know. Yeah, cause, because Danny would just Danny come. He would Danny. show up to our house and walk in. And, it's like, you know, like completely unannounced, Danny will just walk in and then turn everything upside down. And next to it, it's like, what the hell is going on? And Danny's like, dude, because he also looked. He also, he lived downstairs from us, so yeah, Danny, Danny was right. And to give you an idea, just look at that outfit and those sunglasses Danny has on. Yeah, he looks he looks <laughs> like a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> like some kind of mafia gangster. So. Well, well actually, actually, he did kind of have a mob job. He uh, he worked for the Russian mob. I'll never forget this, because he got me oh, He worked with the Russian mob, and he was finding these women husbands in the United States. <laughs> Yeah, mail and, order master. Yes, <laughs> and uh, and 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 Danny was good at it. You know, I think he married three or four of them too. <laughs> so, I remember one time he says to me, he says uh, somebody was saying something, or he's not married. He goes, "Yes, I am. I have two. And he had. Two <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> like, I, don't know, I, I think that's bigotry. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, but, but the Russians <laughs> actually hired him, and he went out. And, but Danny was always, you know what, you know, Danny was a criminal. <laughs> he was a different type of criminal than I was, and uh, he was a criminal. And But we all grew up, Danny grew up in the streets. You know, we all grew up in the streets, and uh, people say, oh, yeah, but when you don't have no food on your plate, you know. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do to survive. When your stomach's people, empty, yeah. yeah I, I mean, left the house at 16. You can't judge that either. Know. You know, I, you know, I, you know, people judge it. And I'm like, you, you cannot judge what you know nothing about. Yep. You know, you're starving. You're not starving. You don't know what starving is until you're starving. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, you know, people, oh, I'm so star, I'm starving. I'm like, you're yeah, not you know. You remember when you quit your first job and then you realize how hungry you are like a week later and you ain't got no money? Yeah. yeah. Should I need to eat? Terrible. <laughs> I know, quit once. Oh, that yeah. was it. <laughs> One thing I love about Stevie, too, is Stephen knows I was in the mob genre and I got in this genre. But Stevie's always the one person that knew what I was doing. He couldn't believe I was doing that well at it. Was that would that be correct, Steve? A hundred percent, man. I, I didn't like for one. You're very knowledgeable. You're very knowledgeable, and you're very good at like you know getting all the details and all that type of stuff. And some of the shit I was like, I, I, can I curse? Of course, yeah. All right, so, well, a, couple anyway. curses, a couple curses are allowed. I, I don't know if you get charged for that or whatever. You got like, one you know, of some them. of the stuff that you 
Yeah. Some of the stuff that you guys would say, or well, you would say, like I would look it up and I'm like, wow, it's actually true. Like, so you're well researched and it's, it was kind of surprising. And, 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 and with, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to, you know, it really hit home with, with, uh, with the wrestling challenge you had. Some of the interviews that you did were like really good, but like the Rob Van Dam, the Vince Russo, it's like, you're really scaling it up and very fast. So yeah, I mean, it is kind of unbelievable, but like I'm, I'm proud of you, man. Like it's awesome. It's well, here's really, it's really how it's awesome. believable, and this is why I think it is. Lee used to be an athlete. Lee loves statistics. Lee is into competition, and I think he makes it a competition for himself. And unlike a lot of people his age, I'm going to say it, he continues to learn. People stop learning at a certain. Lee loves to learn about things. He'll research something right after this show, he's and, and I, I, I like that about him. He, he's he's really he's like that, you know. And, and he Steve, loves them stats. Steve, what did you think of this moment? Were you kind of surprised? Hey. Yeah, him Lee. Yeah, Lee Cole. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's Sammy Gravano. You know, he's responsible for 19 murders, and. Uh, yep. And people always laugh because I drove up on them. And people and say, you well, got a lot of balls, man. <laughs> no, it's, more, it's, more stupidity than, it's more stupidity than balls. Yeah. But, you, but that's part of what we, our family is. Danny was the same way. Danny would do the same exact thing as that. You know he would. Yeah, but I don't do that. Anymore. I, I got a million stories about Danny. Danny. Danny's another one, like Tom, like he, I can go on and on about Danny. Like he was super funny. I mean, like, I don't know. I think I think a lot like we like a lot of the family just has that ability. You could grab a microphone and stand on stage and make people laugh. Danny was up there. Everything you know, about Danny, like and that's funny you said that because I would have loved to have a show on YouTube with Danny. Miss me and him. Oh my god! Can you imagine Danny on YouTube? Oh my god! <laughs> oh god, that'd be great. And you know, I always said to myself. If Tom knew that I was here in the wrestling genre, he would say, "What the hell's going on? What am I like in another world?" But but you know, it's like uh, uh, what, all of us. And I always tell this to people. Uh, Maggie will tell this to people too. Maggie became a martial artist, and she's probably one of the best women martial artists in the country. She, Maggie, you're an eighth degree black belt, which is considered uh, very rare amongst women in Taekwondo. Would you say that's true? Very true. Okay. And if you're going to find them, you'll find them more in Korea than you would here in the United States. Matter of fact, there's only one woman, uh, a ninth degree black belt, I'm talking about active, that she's down in Florida. And that's the only one I've ever found higher than you. And she and she's a legend in, in it. In the, so Maggie, are you planning on trying to go be a ninth or tenth degree black belt? I, 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 I'm not even, look, I, I don't even think of that, you know. How hard would it be for you to go to your ninth degree black belt? Well, you know, once you get into these ranks, it's not about what you do physically. It's what you do for others and um, the, the change you are in the world. You know, that's what it's about. I mean, you know, it's not something you can go to college for and get the super master's degree. Um, so you know, it's, it's putting your time in and dedicating your whole life to it. Basically, this is my life. This is what I do. It's all I do. And, um, you know, it's a big commitment, but I love what I do. No day feels like work to me. And, um, you know, I start. I've been writing more and, and, uh, co-author of a couple of uh, books, business martial art books and things like that. So I found a, I found a love for writing, um, which is ironic um, because I never liked reading. Um, and if you don't read, you don't write that well. But um, yeah, so I mean, if it happens. You're probably happens. opposite of me and Tom. We love to read. I, I would think, think that, uh, you know, like you have that left. But you see, the, the difference between me and Tom and you, Maggie, is that you had more uh, discipline than Tom and I. Yeah. That would be. Uh, risky business is here. Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's going on, man? Hey, it's been Uncle Ray. Ray. It's hey, Steve. People, hey, people, this guy's yes. like, hey, Steve, you're back from the dead. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> I tell you. I can't hold the nigga down. <laughs> I, always, I always say, don't ever, don't ever count out the calls, man. 
if every doctor in the place tells you you got like 2% chance of living, you're going to be the 2%. I seen it over and over again with your aunt <laughs> over here, the whole family. It's amazing. I'm so glad that you're doing okay. And Ray, we got, we got, you. We got you, your sir. twin right. We got your twin right above you. Nice yes. hair, buddy. You got yes. good hair. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I was younger, yeah. You got to have a nice head to shave your 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 head, and you got a you nice know, head. You're good. Tom was <laughs> always very envious of my head. You know, I didn't have much. Yeah, I didn't have was. much. Didn't have much over yeah. him as far as looks and everything. <laughs> But uh, he would just comment, man, you got a great head, man. I'm telling you. Let me, let, me tell you let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, Ray. I showed you a picture to Angel Gotti. And yeah. she goes, oh, what a good looking man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there it is. Uh, Tom used to always say, man, if I had a head like yours, I'd shave my hair off. Right a lot of people don't. They have the weird little peanut head going on. No, you got to have Tom a good head to, say, to shave it. Tom used to say, I have a head head like a cyclops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, but thank you for the hat, Lee. Okay, you take care, Risky Business. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks. When, when are you going to be sliding across your living room again? When's Maggie? <laughs> I'm leaving, I'm leaving Monday, Lee. Uh oh, he's got he's got his white briefs waiting and everything. That old that old time rock and roll. Yes. I, I was telling Maggie that when she leaves the house, Ray probably gets all excited and slides across the uh, yeah, put his white underwear like Tom Cruise, and so yep. Maggie Maggie calls him risky business. That's great. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that was nice. You, you see, this is what I love about entertaining. You never know what's going to happen. I didn't think Stephen was going to come on the show today. I didn't think Ray was going to come on the show. And that's the great thing, people, yeah. about when you do entertaining and you're up here. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah. So, Could you imagine if Danny, Alice, and Tom were all alive and they were on the show right now? Oh, my God. Oh, dude. my God. It would, no, <laughs> we, would, we would be billionaires. And no, we'd no, be like the Whitakers of the... Uh, the, the oh. <laughs> That's even <laughs> oh god Lee. <laughs> do you guys know who the Whitakers are yeah right? i know who the Whitakers are Soft yeah, right under belly. <laughs> they're, this, they're this inbred family and they live in oh. they, they live in the ozarks and no. they drink they drink mountain dew all day oh my god <laughs> no no when i was no, no that shows like crazy i mean and if Alice and Danny were on the same screen at one time, oh, you could, oh. You, you know, it, it would be insane. People have no If you idea. could get Tom, <laughs> if you can get Tom, so with the, I don't know if you were ever present for one of these, Stevie. Tom and Alice, they used to rap, but Alice would do it in a country version of rap and they would diss each other and go back and forth. Oh, oh my <laughs> gosh. They did it at Matt's funeral. It was the funniest thing. And, and, and go back, they, they would battle back and back, back and forth, back and forth. Hilarious. That would be awesome. Yeah, and I, I always regret because I, I filmed Tom, Tom pretending he was a rapper named Milkbone. Uh, <laughs> Milkbone. <laughs> and he used to rap, and his rap name was Milkbone. But it oh, was like Lord. a satire, like uh, yeah, 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 being being funny. And and we, and a matter of fact, we I do have an audio of Tom and Danny together. Yeah, I know. I know that audio. Yeah, and that's funny because uh, they're kind of making fun of me there, too. Yeah, no, so, I sent it to you, Lee. Yeah, yeah, that was funny. Me, me, me. And it, it was like, Lee, where is she hiding, they were saying. And it's like, uh, it, it was just funny. And it's yeah, like, it's uh, very funny. Yeah. So, guys, I want to close this out. So, Maggie, um, I want to ask you, would it, uh, okay, so you know this whole thing. What do you like? What do you want to see come from the lawsuit against Vince McMahon? Now there's two of them. There's one with the Ring Boys, and there's one with Janelle Grant. Uh, what would you like to see happen with that? I mean, they should get retribution. Uh, they should get the help that they need to heal. And um, you know, there has to be consequences for everybody involved. You know, it can't. Things can't continue to happen and not have consequences because that's why people continue to do what they're doing. And well, see, if we can do it and get away with it, I can. You know, there has to be consequences. When you think about the whole thing with, you know, the other uh, several other cases, you know, where are these people? Why aren't they being brought to justice? Why aren't they in jail? Like the whole P. Diddy thing. Like, where yeah. are all the people who committed these crimes against these people? Why? Why? Are, why are they walking around on the street? But here's the question. Here's the question, though. Why are they deciding to arrest P. P. Diddy now? 
Yeah. Why, why did they go after Epstein after all this time later? Yeah. And what happened you know? to everyone that was guilty with Epstein? Yeah. Where, why are they out on the street? Why aren't they being held accountable? So how long is it going to be? Before, how long is it going to be before we heard that P. Diddy fell down and hit his head in the shower? Yeah. Well, but well, if anything, you know, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, probably uh, be by hanging. And I'm going to tell people, coming. as a member, uh, as a big part of the mob genre, I'm going to tell people, do not believe when the feds say P. Diddy did all this stuff. I'm not sticking up for him because they've done it to many people. Yeah. Someone's they're very selective on who they put in jail, exactly. And if they're always, if they're, if they're most, we look what they has happened. Whether you like Donald Trump or not, we have seen all the false accusation, all the trials he's been through. Yep. It's that easy. I've dealt with the law my whole life. I've had things happen to me in the law. I remember when. I know when, you were never guilty, Lee. No, no, <laughs> actually, I remember when Tom and I, Tom and I, got involved and we robbed a couple houses up in Somers. I eventually, oh I, I got pulled in by the state troopers up there, and I'm sitting there, and they come in with this file, and they said, "Well, I want you guys to, well, he, well actually, I wouldn't give up Tom or or Adam, but they said to me." Here's 70 burglaries we know that you did. I'm like, 70 burglaries? What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. They'll pin you with everything, man. And then they're telling me about one burglary that we did, and they're listening to things that we we took. And then, then, then they go, we find out that the, the husband, uh, we never took no wedding ring. It was like a $5,000 wedding ring. But he put it on their insurance report. I'm that he did. Favor. He put the yeah. ring on the insurance report. Damn. So you, but but I remember that day because they wanted so badly for me to take these 75 cases so they can close them. Of course. And I refused. Yep. I said, I didn't do that. Once you know? they get something or someone in their in their sights, they forget to, you know, investigate anything else. That's and I, that's and I remember it was the first time I was arrested, and they said to me, Well, if you say you take this, we'll give you five years probation. <laughs> and, but but I wound up getting five years probation anyway in a felony. Yeah. Yeah, always fight it. You remember my case, what happened. I fought it in one. They they, they want to stick you with stuff. They want to make you look bad. And Steve has no cases because he's never violated. <laughs> See, Steve's a smart criminal. He never got caught. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Jails are full of the dumb ones. Yes. That's what I used to tell people. And, and, let me tell, and, and Nagy's not as innocent as she looks. I'm so, dead. you know. <laughs> I'm all about everybody else. Yeah. Well, if I wasn't, I wouldn't be here. I'll tell well, you, guys, that. you stay here. I'm going to end this. Everybody, thank you very much. Please subscribe to our channel. We yes, have, we have we've gotten 5,000 new subscribers this month. Thank you so much. And well, we got a bunch of women that are subscribing because they think that Renee's handsome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, Maggie's like, oh, look, the younger version of Ray. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, guys, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed the show. And we just wanted to tell you who Tom was. And uh, everybody take care.